Hello everybody and welcome back. My name is Deborah Hatswell and you're listening to BBR Investigations. Autumn is definitely kicking in at the moment and it's the time of year when it's good to curl up with a warm blanket and a hot drink and listen to some spooky tales. Now if you are a regular listener or a new comer to our channel you will hear me say from time to time that I don't believe that some people live in a series of haunted houses. I don't think it's as simple as that. It's almost like they were just unlucky when they chose their home. Now I hear from people whose very first experiences are as babies or toddlers. I was terrified in my room as a kid. I can remember my mum being exasperated with me because I wouldn't settle down and sleep in our new home way back in the 70s. We'd moved from a small two up, two down, as they call it in the north, in an area that had been heavily bombed during the war. And I would get myself out of my cot each night by throwing myself over the bars and I'd slide on my bottom to try to get downstairs to my mum. I think the hope was when we moved, I'd get into a routine and settle down better at night. And that was like jumping from the frying pan into a huge raging inferno for me. Everything ramped up in the new flat. Every house I've ever lived in has had some weird events that were just passed over and just forgotten as time went on. When I moved into my first two up, two down myself in the 80s, I was 19. My mother-in-law would visit and sit with a coat on, huddled up like a toddler on the closest seat to the front door. She hated that house and I have to admit I did too. Walking up to it after work each night and putting my key in the door made me so depressed and sad. I never understood that and I never did find out why. We had the old rotary phones back then and ours was at the bottom of the staircase and neither me and my husband would sit on the comfortable carpeted stairs to take a call as your back was to the upstairs landing that was also so creepy and dark. Even with the light on it was dark. It felt like something was watching you all the time, brooding and seething as you tried to ignore it. We would stand stock still, uncomfortably, back to the wall to answer the phone, keeping your eye on the stairwell at all times. I used to make my husband stand at the door when I had an evening bath. I was convinced there was an old man on the landing who was watching, leering at me. I could feel his presence hanging over the hallway. If I closed my eyes, I'd see him holding me down in the water. I hated that house. Every house I've ever lived in has had a something. Wandering around at night. I think this will be the same for many of you. All the taps would turn on fully at 4am in my last address. I'd put it down to water pressure. You could smell baked cake sometimes when no one had baked and heard footsteps upstairs and on the landing and all manner of strange goings on. Our next witness describes her life in this next report in a way that makes it easy to imagine yourself in her shoes. A case of too many haunted houses. Dear Deborah, it's been a while since I first touched base with you. I thought I would share some of my experiences that your listeners may enjoy. Back in 1990, when I was 17, nearly 18 years old, I moved into a shared house in a small rural town called Lewes, which is situated just outside the coastal town of Brighton in the south of England. The house had four floors to it. The basement floor had the sitting room and the kitchen. Then that led to a back door and a lane to the train station. The first floor had my small bedroom, two toilets and a bathroom with a hallway to the front door and a staircase to the upper floors and a second set of stairs that passed my room. And this second set of stairs led down to the basement. And then the second floor had two bedrooms and a second set of stairs, which went up to a converted loft space, which was converted to another bedroom. The house was filled with a mixed bunch of well-educated divorcees and middle-class arty types who didn't have enough money to get their own place. I stood out as a young teenage girl who was clearly into metal and heavy rock music and studying art and drama at the local college. 
I was working part time, dancing for stag parties, and I hung out out with the local bikers, etc. I was actually a very nice young lady, I'll be a bit rebellious and headstrong. So the property was very basic. It was filled with second-hand furniture and there were no carpets downstairs. Lots of wooden floorboards and creaky old stairs, etc. I was the only person sleeping downstairs. There was nobody or nothing below me but our communal living space. I moved in late September, college had already started and this little room was perfect. It was at the back of the house, above the back door with a view of the trees and a quiet country lane. Outside my window was a big honeysuckle plant. When I opened my window up, I could get this lovely scent that would drift into my room in the evening and I was very happy living there. As I started to get to know the other people living in the property, I became aware that they would normally socialise in the evening downstairs, have a glass of wine and a shared meal. And eventually I started to join them, gradually coming out of my shell a little bit more each time. When people were down in the communal area, I could hear them moving the dining table chairs around and the sofa feet would scrape across the floorboards. And you could access the basement by some old creaky stairs that started directly outside my bedroom door. So I knew when people were going downstairs, as I'd hear them. And also there was a gravel yard from the back door that led to a small gate leading out to the lane. And you could hear people crunching up that gravel path to the door before coming in from my room. One evening I'd been working on a project for my art class and I decided to go and make a coffee. I could hear the chairs moving around downstairs and I figured I'd have a chat with whoever was there while the kettle was boiling. I walked down the stairs calling out hi as I went to find no one there. I could have sworn someone would be there. I'd heard them. I'd heard the back door go. I was puzzled. I made my coffee and I went back to my room. A bit later on I could hear the same noises again and I went to investigate. And again There was no one there. Now the whole house I'd grown up in had weird stuff going on all the time and I knew plenty in regards to ghostly activity. I was not impressed with the idea that I had moved into another haunted location. I tried not to dwell on it too much and I had a very busy social life so I wasn't always there. And as the months rolled on, the activity became much more apparent And I started to question some of the other residents. None of them had any issues. They'd never noticed anything strange. And they implied it was my overactive imagination. And I felt pissed that they didn't take me seriously, to be honest. I started to have my friends stay over with me. And one night, there was a bunch of us camping out in my room. And about 10 to midnight, we heard the stairs creaking outside my bedroom door but we had not heard anyone coming down from the first floor or anyone enter through the front door. We then heard the chairs moving around below us and we all decided to have a nose around and see what was going on. We crept down the stairs and we noticed there were no lights on. Clearly no one was actually using the rooms and no one had left as the back door was locked. We tested the chairs to confirm the noise and a couple of my friends went upstairs to listen And they also confirmed that it was the same noise that we could hear in my room. Eventually, we all returned to my room and waited. And it then happened again. We ran downstairs and switched on the light, but still there was nobody there. We sat around for most of the night, waiting to see if anything else would happen with us all. But there was nothing. It was quiet. None of my friends doubted me after that, and I felt quite validated. I stayed living in the house and I didn't feel threatened by it and at some point I had a friend sleep there on the sofa for a few weeks after he got kicked out from his parents' home. He was into uh, the bonfire society that celebrated bonfire night every year on the 5th of November in a big way in Luz. He had a Native American costume that he was preparing as part of the coming festival celebrations and he'd been threading coloured beads to its breastplate in his spare time. Now the costume was about 80% completed when one morning he called me down to the living room space and said, look what the ghost did. 
and I looked at his costume and all the beads had been taken off and re-threaded in a different pattern. It wouldn't have taken weeks to do that. And I'd seen it the night before. It was perfectly done, but completely the wrong colour pattern than had previously been used. I was shocked and he moved out after that experience. Things would get more active from spring to summer the following year and at one point, when I was in a very low mood, it drove me so mad that I was shouting at it. It was daytime and the chairs downstairs were constantly moving and there was no one else in the house as I was in my room trying to sleep. The back door would open and shut but no gravel was moving or the gate was closing. My window was wide open and I was fed up with the ghost trying to get my attention. It went on all day till I shouted at it and then I left to go around to see a friend. I came back the next day and all was quiet again, thankfully. Around this time, I started to date a local biker who lived on the other side of Lewes on a farm. Eventually, he took me back to meet the guys who lived with him and they informed me that it wouldn't be a good idea if I stayed overnight as their house was haunted too, but not in a nice way. I pushed them to explain more and they told me that several women were known to have hung themselves on the premises over time and that whenever a girlfriend stayed over, it would cause some kind of reaction. I visited the old farmhouse several times before staying overnight and I did not experience anything unexplained. I hated going to use their toilet downstairs though, but I would push that aside and just use it. The guys would often tell me to take the cat with me as he'd hiss if the ghost was about. I never did this, but some of the other visiting girlfriends did. I'd begun to think that the group were just telling me a yarn, you know, just to scare us girls when we all had a strange experience one evening. I was going to stay over as it had got quite icy outside and it was a bit of a walk back to mine. The conversation went quiet when one of the bikers told us to shh abruptly and then we heard a musical note being strummed from the old mandolin that was on the floor next to the sofa. It played a couple of chords and then it went still. The cat that had been asleep on an armchair opposite suddenly sprang up and leapt out of the kitchen and we looked at each other and the conversation turned to stories about the ghost. One of the former bikers who had moved out had been alone in the house one evening and this was when they'd first moved in and had only been there for a few months. He'd been sitting on the sofa watching the TV when he suddenly heard a door slam from the upper floors in the house. Now the layout of this house was quite old-fashioned and everyone entered it from the yard and this led straight to the kitchen. To the left was a toilet and a shower room and all the rooms were very dilapidated and almost unusable. The kitchen led it into a living room, which was an oblong shape. Behind the wall, on the right, was the door to the stairs that led to the first floor bedrooms. To get to the second floor, you had to walk through the main bedroom to another door and a set of stairs to the loft. The biker was convinced someone was in there and he grabbed a metal pole and he legged it upstairs to see who it was. He found no one in any of the rooms, but as he left the loft room, the door slammed shut behind him. The door in front of him opened and he ran for his life. Each door he exited through, then slammed shut behind him. They eventually found him at the end of the track that enters the farm property, crouched down and frozen. He was in his box of shorts, socks and t-shirt, absolutely panicked and refusing to go back into the building without his mates. I was also told it was a freezing cold evening and there had been a small snow flurry outside, but he still stayed out there until they checked out the house and came to get him. Apparently a vicar was called out to do an exorcism on the property and they had to remove all of their personal belongings from the house whilst this was performed and comments were made about their choice of music and they were not told not to bring the Led Zeppelin or the Ozzy Osbourne LPs back into the building. I don't know if they did, but I know it was unlikely that a vicar would have performed an exorcism as this rite was part of the Catholic faith. Perhaps he meant a blessing.
I loved the story when they told it, but I decided to stay away and eventually went up to bed with my boyfriend. Nothing untoward seemed to happen during the night, but at breakfast we all noticed a picture that had been displayed on the wall the night before, and somehow it had been taken off the wall and placed against the fireplace with its back to us. My boyfriend picked it up and we all gasped when he turned it around. The pictures were of four old-fashioned postcards and they were now in a completely different sequence to how they'd originally been displayed. We looked at the back of the frame again and we noticed that the old tape had not been tampered with. This held the blackboard to the frame and it was clearly intact all the way around the flare. It was yellow and very old, as was the picture. Again, a few weeks went by and nothing else really seemed to be happening. Then one afternoon, the mandolin started up again and an old electric fire came on by itself. The damn thing was not even plugged in. The main bar started to glow and emit heat at the same time the mandolin strummed. We all got off the sofa and backed up away from the items while trying to work out how the fire had come on. After a few intense minutes, it had all calmed back down again and we decided a trip over to the gardener's arms in Lewes was called for. Shortly after this, my boyfriend moved in with me at my place. A year or so later, my boyfriend and I decided to move to North Cornwall and we moved back to my mother's house in Portslade while we prepared for our move. And this was the house I'd grown up in. Uh, it made me feel so uncomfortable as a child. It was a semi-detached three-bedroom property just around the corner to Portslade train station. I'd been an only child and I never slept well in the house all my life. We never moved and my parents had bought the property back in the 60s. My room as a young child had been the smallish room. It had an airing cupboard in it and a sink. The window looked out onto the back and we had a good-sized garden. Outside my room was the landing with the loft hatch above. And on the right was a second bedroom. And I stayed in this when I was 13 or 14 years old, up until I moved out. The landing was an L shape leading up the stairs and the bathroom was directly above the front door downstairs. My parents' room was at the front, next to it directly above the sitting room. And as a child, the sitting room had been used as a bedroom for my granddad, my mother's dad. He lived with us following the death of my grandmother in 74. He passed away in 1975 in that room. And then my dad knocked the dividing wall down at the front and they joined the sitting room and the living room together. He then built a wooden extension on the back. Later, my stepfather replaced this with a brick and glass extension, which included extending the kitchen. Downstairs was much bigger than the upstairs in this property. As a child, I'd been told by my mother that both the ha this house and the one joined to it were both up to sale together. My parents looked at both. My mother, who is sensitive and comes from a family on her maternal side, who are clairvoyant and followers of the spiritualist church, said that the house had a very bad energy. And there were locks on the outside of the main bedroom and an empty coffin shaped box filled with women's clothing in the back garden half buried in the overgrown grass. My mother chose our house and it all seemed fine until a few months after we'd moved in. My parents were sleeping in a little bedroom, the one I ended up with as a child, when one night they were woken up as things were levitating and vibrating in the room. The bed shook hard for several seconds and a cup lifted up from the table and then it all stopped. Everything went silent and nothing else happened. When my parents were decorating the property one day, there was a terrifying disembodied scream that was heard by them and my mother's parents who were helping them. Everyone had been in different rooms. My grandparents were downstairs. They all met on the landing just in time to hear a big bang. It sounded like a, gr a gun, my granddad said, and none of them were responsible for the scream and the house next door was still empty. My mother told me that a couple of years later, her milkman told her that the previous owner of the house next door had been hanged for killing his wife. 
He'd caught her with another man and he shot her. And he was apparently one of the last to be hung in the area and he'd been a real nasty man. And that's why the house next door had been on the market for so long. When the neighbours moved in, she never told them the story. I had an awful time sleeping in that little room. As soon as I left the cot and was given a bed, I'd leave my room every night and sleep on the landing outside my parents' bedroom. It drove them mad and they put a lock on the outside of my door to try and keep me in there. This led to me waking up and feeling frozen with terror. I wouldn't move and I'd be sweating with fear, sure that something was standing over me. I became very sick around that age, about four I was then, and I had to go into hospital for a few months. I remember feeling so at ease there and I slept very well. I had a full recovery, but I remained a sickly child while I slept in that room. It is also interesting that around this time, my grandparents passed away. My maternal grandmother passed away when I was about three or four, following several strokes. I don't recall many memories of her, but I was very close to my granddad. He used to teach me boxing and feed me his bacon every breakfast. I loved having him around. And at this stage, the living room and sitting room were separated still, and there was no extension. My granddad had the room at the front downstairs and he passed away in there a year after his wife had died. Even after the two rooms were opened up to make a living room, I always felt like he was close by. One family friend who was a medium told my mother he would always be by her side and I believe that he still is. I recall around 1999, I'd been visiting my mother with my baby son and we were sitting in the living room watching him crawl around. He needed to be changed, so I sat on the sofa and I took out the things I needed to change him and knelt down on the floor with him. I took out his soother and I put it up on the sofa behind me to keep it clean. And after I'd finished changing him, I turned to get the soother to find it had gone. I searched everywhere. I took all the cushions and blankets previously on the sofa during the search. My mother looked too, and after half an hour, we just gave up. Frustrated, she left the room to put the kettle on and I put the cushions and the blankets back on the sofa. We went over to where my son was. We all walked back over to the sofa and we were about to sit down when I noticed the soother sitting in the middle of the centre cushion and it was just exactly where I'd left it. How did we miss it in our frantic search? Another time I was helping to put some shopping away in the kitchen when I turned around and I noticed a loaf of bread was sitting in the middle of the kitchen floor at the other end of the room. No one was near it. I hadn't seen it move. It just went from the shopping bag over the sink to sitting on the floor the other side of me. The whole event was completely nuts. Getting back to 1991, my boyfriend and I were preparing to move to Tintagel, North Cornwall. We'd moved in with my mother and stepfather for a few months beforehand. Now, I had a lovely friend back then who went out with a guy who followed the left-hand path. My boyfriend was a member of the Bards, Ovates and the Druids and I was studying Wicca. I was having a nap in my room and my boyfriend was reading when I suddenly woke up and I couldn't move. I couldn't even speak. I could see out the corner of my eye, my boyfriend was on the floor reading and the curtain behind him was moving, but there was no breeze. I felt really cold and I started to meditate using the white light method. And after a few minutes, the sensation of being paralysed seemed to wear off. I felt compelled to call my friend and I felt really worried about her. She was alone at her home and she said that her boyfriend was having some serious issues with other Satanists. My boyfriend and I went over to a house and immediately felt some oppressive energy outside the home. We'd only been there about 20 minutes when my friend told us that there was a big black cat sitting outside her patio door, just staring at her. My boyfriend tried to shoo it away, but it just kept growling and hissing at him. The cat then started to walk back and forth in the garden, never taking its gaze off us. We sat around performed a protection meditation for an hour and eventually it disappeared and the energy seemed normal. 
We went to bed and all seemed well. And when I returned home the next day, my mother told me that she'd had a terrible night. There was a couple of cats and they were screeching outside in the back garden most of the night. And she had an awful nightmare of a big black cat with piercing red eyes that was stalking her. The reason my boyfriend and I were going over to Cornwall was because we'd made friends with some local witches while on holiday there and we decided to open up a new age shop with them. We'd become friends with them following a terrifying night when my boyfriend and I experienced some really weird goings on. We were in our third day camping on the caravan site in Tintagel. We'd ridden down on my boyfriend's motorbike and we were travelling around Cornwall sightseeing. We found a museum in Boscastle that was dedicated to witchcraft and we spent the day there. We had another couple of bikers from Wolverhampton join us and we found out that they were staying in a B&B in Tintagel and we got chatting. We all made our way back to Tintagel where we met up with some locals and chatted about where we'd been that day. They were very knowledgeable and gave us a lot of info on the area. My boyfriend and I went back to our tent and arranged to meet up with the Wolverhampton couple for drinks in the Cornishman later that evening. A storm strolled in and after our dinner at the Cornishman we decided to have an early night. The storm was really bad as we left and as we walked back to our tents I noticed a dark shadow sweep along downwards towards the trail at the old ruins. I had an ominous feeling and I became hyper vigilant and as we entered the caravan park I felt like something was following us and I was filled with dread. I told my boyfriend and we tried to do some meditation, but I could not focus. After an hour, I was desperate to use the local facilities and I had to traipse across the field in the pitch dark in sheets of rain. And as I left, a fox made a terrible shriek that sounded like, I don't know. I started to run. I nearly wet myself because I was so afraid. With a shower block, I entered the toilets, but I felt that I couldn't shut the door. I was just staring at the entrance as I did my business. I thought I could hear growling, but the wind was whipping up, so I could have been mistaken. I ran back to the tent as fast as I could and I told my boyfriend, and he suggested we go back to the pub and collect ourselves. It was about 10 p.m., so quite early. It was also late October, so that's why it was dark. And as we walked back past the track towards the ruins, I felt really emotional and started to cry. When we got to the pub, we ordered some stiff drinks and sat in a quiet area by the front door. And just then, the couple from Wolverhampton came in and they looked really stressed, but told us we looked like we'd seen a ghost. We told them our story and they said there'd been a wrapping on their glass through the bedroom window. They looked out the window and saw what appeared to be a handprint on the outside of the glass. And that was why they'd come back to, to the pub. We all felt really uncomfortable and I decided that we should go and see if we could locate the local couple we'd met earlier. They told us where they lived and we all turned up on their doorstep just after the pub shut. We explained what had gone on. We all sat around meditating on protection before returning to our beds. The local couple gave us some rose quartz to take back with us. And I felt much better returning to our tent. The following morning, we unzipped the tent to see a real mess all around us. Another tent had been blown apart and all the belongings were scattered across the field. And bins had been blown over and an old static caravan was damaged. Our tent and the motorbike were completely undisturbed and we slept like a log. And as we walked back to the village, an ambulance was coming back up the track from the old ruins. And I heard a couple of locals walking their dogs found another suicide, sadly. When we met up with our Wolverhampton friends, they too had slept really soundly and not experienced anything else that night. The rest of the holiday was just spent in Tintagel and Boss Castle after that. We moved there in 92 and then experienced even more strange events. This time with lights over the old ruins on Tintagel Head. We saw some strange green and red barbs flying in our bedroom at night. Locals told us about UFOs that they'd seen out over the Atlantic Ocean and the strange lights seen on the ruins were a regular event. We must have seen them three or four times in the first year. 
We stayed there for a couple of years before finally returning to the Loos area following family issues. My boyfriend and I split up in 96, but all my strange adventures have just kept right on, year in, year out. I've experienced a string of incidents around my friend's now ex-boyfriend, and I made some intriguing discoveries as a result. I remain open to all kinds of phenomena, and I use my senses to guide me throughout my life. I have a reoccurring voice that talks to me. It even argues with me. And it saved my life, even told me that someone was going to die. My partner and I experienced synchronistic activity almost daily. And he also had lots of personal experiences in his life. We were even brought together by it. Now, I had a look at the local area where I witnessed shared the house with the RT residents in the place called Offen Hill. It's just a short walk up the road. And that's known for legends of ghostly howls. Now, it has been reported that one or two horse riders near the old race course opposite Offen Hill have been a little apprehensive when they've heard a god awful sound. Now, they are not many who walk over the chart pit so early in the morning, but those who do enjoy a quiet stroll in the last few days in May are likely to hear shrieks and moans and the occasional whinny of a horse without being able to specifically locate the precise area from which the noises originate. One local stated, around seven o'clock in the morning, I heard wild screams and shouts coming from the chart pit. According to one middle-aged musician who was exercising his dog, he heard a general melee of clatter. He was so puzzled by the sounds that he spent nearly an hour trying to find some cause or reason for the phenomena, but he was unsuccessful. In 1984, there's another report that could possibly be connected to the dark figure seen running in the storm. The Leaf Man of Sussex, 1984. I'd been with three friends when it happened. It must have been around 84, during a time when it was normal for us kids to be playing out in the woods as long as we were home for a certain time. I think we were playing not far from what people now know as Falkington Wood. And it was around dusk and we were all sitting around and lighting a campfire when suddenly from the shadows and like in all good horror films, we heard the snap of a twig. We all sensed at once that we were being watched. But as teenagers, we were brazen and we goaded whatever was lurking in the bushes to come out and fight. We all armed ourselves with sticks and stones, only to have our eyes met by a horrifying sight. Out from the shadows came a tall, spindly figure, which seemed to be covered in hair, which in turn was matted with leaves. The creature gave off a horrid stench, and through the entangled hair that covered its face, we could see two burning eyes, as I'm sure you can imagine, we were all terrified and we fled, never once looking behind us to see if a monster was in pursuit. Of course, no one believed our story when we told it, but as we got older, and most of us, except one, remained friends, we often spoke about the creature we named. The Leaf Man. People often ask, were we the victims of a hoax? Memories can be hazy, but this thing seemed real and more than just a man in a suit. Now, oddly, there's another report of a so-called leaf man, but from Kent this time. And again, it involves a group of youths playing in an area and encouraging something to come out of the bushes. Now, some people believe, however, that the creature was in fact a ghost of a soldier, adorned in camouflage, enabling him in life to conceal himself amongst the foliage. Mm, it's a bit flowery for me. I'm not sure about the explanation at all, but I suppose it makes it easier to file the case away rather than admit defeat. Now, just before COVID in 2020, I attended and spoke at a conference in Hull. Paul Sinclair, Bob Brown, Ben Emily and Jones were also speaking. And I gave a talk on the British Bigfoot reports and I included a number of reports sent in to me here at BBR. And at the end of my speech, a number of people waited patiently to talk to me alone and share their experiences from the Yorkshire area. 
One lady had her teenage daughter with her and she listened to me speak. She did catch my eyes a few times and I wondered if we'd met before. And when we got chatting, she explained that her daughter had some of her teenage friends had seen and fo been followed by a leaf-covered horror a few times on their way to and from school. Now, I didn't manage to catch the exact area or the lady's name, so if you are listening, please get in touch. I have a team of investigators who are all set to go and investigate this case. I don't like the idea that girls are being watched and followed from a bushy embankment. I would imagine there's still activity happening down there. Now the banks have had two years and cut to grow even taller. Let's travel back to Brighton and the southeast coast. And if you follow the coast road east and west, you will come across other reports of strange creatures and ghastly howls. One that jumps to mind is the Friston Wood bipedal thing. Now one November morning at approximately 2.30am, a man who drives for a living on the M was on an enforced break along the coastal road close to Eastbourne and he parked his lorry in Friston Park near New Haven. After a long drive, Phil Heyman got out of the vehicle to stretch his legs and catch some air. And there was a red light from a nearby forestry machine and that was illuminating the area. And as Mr Heyman stretched his legs, he was amazed when he saw a dark, eight foot tall, human-like figure, which appeared at the time to be a man emerging from the tree line. Startled by the incident, Phil suddenly jumped back into his cab and the cab door slammed shut behind him. And although shaken by the ordeal, Mr Heyman still managed to grab his flashlight and look out through the window of the cab, only to see a figure running off in the forest. Mr Heyman said, it couldn't have been human, as the skin would have shone in a light. This was a dull figure with no sheen to the skin, so it could possibly have been covered in hair, he said. The creature, according to Mr Hayam, was bipedal. Now, another visit to these woods had a very strange experience in 2002, in the Friston Forest Screams witness report. I was walking through Friston Forest mid-afternoon with my friend who wishes to remain unnamed and we were out walking his dog looking into a rumoured big cat sighting that had recently happened and as we were walking the dog, the dog's sniffing something and it runs into the bushes ignoring our calls. So we start whistling for the dog and we hear this scream come back at us. We do more whistles and the dog's come back with her tail between her legs like something scared the hell out of her. I would like to thank our witnesses for contacting me and allowing me to share their stories. And I'd like to thank our first witness tonight for opening up the discussion about what it's like to live in a series of haunted houses. It's very rare here to find someone prepared to share all of her cards, regardless of ridicule, and I know how hard that can be. I know many others who have also come forward and shared their events and I will bring you those over the coming weeks. I know these stories will resonate with some of you, and you may recognise events of your own that match these. You may have even experienced something in the same area. And if you want to share your experience with us here at BBR, you can do so in complete confidence. Thank you very much for tuning in and listening to us tonight. If you want to support the channel, have a check out some of the links below. A quick click like and give us a share, that helps. So until next time, wrap up warm and I'll see you all next week. Good night, everyone.